Hi there. Uh, my name is Jared Green. I'm a, a mental health physiotherapist in the UK, and it is uh, the 6th of April, and it gives me great pleasure uh, to sp um, spend a little bit of time speaking to Craig Allingham, who is a really, really well-known uh, figure in the world of physiotherapy from Queensland in Australia. And uh, I'm here speaking to Craig because Craig has been one of the uh, really key people internationally in the world of men's health physiotherapy and in particular in uh, doing lots of work for men who have been through surgery for prostate cancer and uh, I'm really honoured to be speaking to Craig this morning because he has uh, really always inspired me and motivated me to get in, in involved in men's health physiotherapy and it's someone we really look to for uh, kind of guidance and, and inspiration so craig uh good morning uh, i'm here in the uk we've actually had snow this morning which is really bizarre as we had sunshine three days ago so really big welcome to you and uh thank you for giving up your time this afternoon from sunny queensland we always think australia's sunny even if it's not well exactly really well it's certainly not snowing here in queensland that's for sure uh, thank you, Jared, and thank you for the opportunity to, to speak to your, your, your audience and uh, across the globe, because, of course, we can't travel there, so this will, this will have to do, yes. That's very true, and hopefully maybe in, hopefully in the not-too-distant future. So, Craig, so I know you as, um, you know, a really esteemed kind of uh, mental health physiotherapist, a uh, person who does a lot of work in helping others uh, develop their physiotherapy business. Um, you've written one really seminal book that I find lots of men um, really get a get huge amount of help from. So that's the Prostate Recovery Map or Men's Action Plan. And, and I think that's a, a book that, that uh, men get so much from. And then you've also written the Prostate Playbook and you're heavily involved um, in uh, kind of training other physiotherapists in Australia to really be able to see these men both pre and post prostate cancer. But you do lots of other stuff in the community, for, for both in men's health, in uh, building male community. So just tell us a little bit about the other stuff you do in relation to both men's health and also supporting men who are going through the prostate cancer. Uh, yeah, well, thank you. Yes, your audio was breaking up a little there, but I think, uh, I think we're okay. That might have been the microphone. Um, yes, I've been a, a physiotherapist for a ridiculously long time and uh, I arrived in, in men's health uh, by, the, by a route of, of elite sports practice and, and teaching there. But what I do in the community is it gives me great joy, uh, which is working with men. And, and I live in a community here. We, we call it a village, but you would laugh at that because it's, it's far from a village. We do have a pub, so that's a start. Uh, but it's, um, I'm about an hour north of Brisbane on the Sunshine Coast. It's quite a large uh, population centre. And uh, the Budrum area where I live and where I, I, I work from is, uh, is, is sort of a, a, bit of a, a bit of a throwback. Uh, they say it's a retirement village, but we have one of the largest um, primary school in the, in the district uh, in terms of youngsters. So it's, it's in that rejuvenating phase of its population. But there are a lot of older dudes here and I count myself amongst them. And I do a lot of speaking to groups of men and, and like rotary clubs or lions clubs, uh, not that they're, they're completely male anymore, but they're predominantly male here. And also I do a lot of work with our local men's shed. Now, I believe you have some of these men's sheds in the UK and in Ireland um, and they spread to Canada. They started in Australia back just before the year 2000 and they're huge here. And we have a men's shed in our village here that has a membership approximating 300 men. And we have a huge physical facility full of, you know, all the trappings of a men's shed, you know, wood turning and metal working and gardening and all things. But they've given me a sizable gym area and I'm responsible for the health and welfare program for these men. And you know, this is a, a pro bono arrangement, but it gives me two things. One, it gives me the joy of looking after these, these guys and keeping them healthy as they age. But I also learn so much from them in terms of what's troubling them and, and what, 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 uh, how the difficulties they find in navigating 
the illness system, not the health system, but the illness system in Australia, now the NHS for you guys, um, that it is completely foreign for most men until they get crook, you like become unwell, to actually interface with the, uh, the health system. And it's a foreign country to them once they start off. So I do a lot of work educating men, helping them navigate the health system and, and physically working with them in terms of their pre and post prostatectomy rehabilitation. And Greg, that probably brings us nicely to a question that, that someone asked. Those men you see maybe post prostate cancer, what do they wish they were told before their surgery by the urologist? Oh, I'll tell you what they really wish they were told. They would, they would sit down in front of their, their, uh, their urologist and they would be hoping to hear, our mistake, you don't have prostate cancer at all. That's what they really want to hear. But by the time they get past all those tests and, and scores, that's not the message they get. So they get a very confusing amount of fresh data that they find very difficult to assimilate and take on board and, and understand the full implications of because as soon as the doctor, whether it's the urologist or the GP, or the, the practitioner, whoever the, the health practitioner looking after them is, as soon as the word cancer, and particularly prostate cancer, is mentioned, pretty much everything after that is just a mumbled blur uh, because they go into that spiral of fear and dread and, and despair. And you know, this is the end of my productive life. This is the end of my relationship. This is the end of me. This is the, uh, when am I going to see my grandchildren ever again? You know, that, that overwhelming emotive response to the word cancer, which in most prostate cancer situations is not justified, but it carries a heavy whack as soon as they hear cancer and everything else is colored by that initial emotional rush. And no matter what they hear next in subsequent visits from other practitioners, it all gets sort of tainted by this first fear of the cancer and the initial response being cancer in my body must be removed. I must take this cancer out of my body. That's my only option to live well is to get rid of the cancer, which as we know from a lot of research since then, a lot of men are going to die quite happily. Well, no, nobody dies quite happily. That's a bit strong, but they're going to die of other causes and their prostate cancer will just loll around in the background as a, as a low volume, slow growing tumor in their prostate, which is far from a, a life essential organ. Um, you can live quite happily without a prostate because you do when you take it out, but it, uh, it doesn't impact your energy levels. It doesn't impact your, your um, life expectancy if it's a slow growing, low volume, yep. localized prostate stage one, stage two cancer, but it's still a cancer and it still has that fear element. Yes. So what they're hoping to hear is what are my best options? Uh, you will make a full recovery. Yes, we've made a mistake, but I think also what they should have heard from their, their medical care team is take your time making this decision because there is a quite a lot of men reporting post treatment regret. And it didn't matter whether they went down radiation oncology pathway or surgical pathway or, or chemotherapy pathway. There's always the feeling that maybe I should have chosen a different way because I'm not entirely satisfied with the outcome with the one I took. And that's, that's a nil, you know, nil sum game. They're never going to know what would have happened had they taken the other fork yeah. in the road. But that won't stop them beating themselves up about it saying maybe I should have gone down a different path. So take their time, do their homework, ask around, talk to blokes who've had the procedures they're contemplating and finding out what, what the implications are. And being told you're going to be incontinent for some time, we don't know how long, maybe not at all, but you could still be incontinent up to 12 months, to a bloke who's thinking I must get this cancer out of me, doesn't fully register the implications of wearing pads or, or, or nappies for the next 12 months and the inconvenience and the, the feeling of demasculizing and, and not shame, but yeah, certainly embarrassment or risk going out and risk of, can anybody smell it? I've, I've, you know, I've wet, my, wet my, my, my incontinence pad and I need to go and change it somewhere. Is there a bathroom somewhere? Has it got a bin? All that sort of stuff. None of that computes until they're in that situation. So do their homework, talk to people who've been there, done that. Yeah. And I think that's where, especially here in the UK, we've got uh, Prostate Cancer UK, 
which has a, an amazing support network all around the country. But I think it's it's difficult enough to get the men to go with post surgery. They need a bit of encouragement, but it's also important for them to go, you know, once they've had that initial diagnosis. Well, and I think, I think uh, sorry, yeah, Greg. And, and I'll, I'll just, uh, it's a good point you make. And, and my attitude to that is, yes, you've been diagnosed. You need to start your recovery before the surgery. And we do this with athletes. We do this with athletes. We say, you can have a knee reconstruction. You know, you've gone down at football in the second, you know, second half, you've torn your cruciate. We need now to restore the strength in your thigh and in your leg to make, uh, give you a better chance of a good option, a good, good outcome after your knee reconstruction surgery. And you would do the same with your patients here, whether it's foot and ankle surgery, shoulder, shoulder surgery, especially we want to get, get them in with as much mobility and strength around the shoulder before the surgeon start packing and cutting and splicing and tying things and stapling them back together. Because we know from our clinical experience and the research that the stronger you go in, the better you got a chance of coming out yeah. with a good and that brings us nicely to another question, which was actually sent in by a good close friend of mine, Adrian Rykstar, in that, so what are some of the, like, what are, if we can, if that man, it's been decided that they're going to have a radical prostatectomy, what are some top things they can do to prepare pre-surgery? Okay, yes, good, excellent. Um, there's quite a bit, as it turns out, and 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 I think it's it cultivates a much more positive attitude to get them before they're not continent, and before the, while well, they still have erectile function. Anyway, so getting back to your question, several things. One, they need to see uh, a men's health practitioner, preferably a physiotherapist, who understands the exercise program that they will need to do after the surgery and teach it to them beforehand because the advantage of that is all the nerves are intact, all the muscles are intact. The man is not incontinent. He hasn't got a fear of leaking when he comes to visit, but he can learn which muscles he needs to get voluntary control over, which he's never really had to think about before. Yeah. Pelvic floor muscles that he can control, they've, they've worked in, in oblivious discomfort to him and he's relied on his bladder sphincters and various other automated systems. So he's never had to really work on his, except when he's had way too much beer and it's a crowded room and the toilet's on the far side and he's trying to retain urine inside his body. So he will use those pelvic floor muscles before surgery when he's a young lad to get across to the bathroom before he releases for that, that delightful sensation of letting the bladder flow. He needs to retrain that and get that to a, a voluntary control level where he can switch it on when he needs to. He can sustain it for anything up to a minute and, and, and master that skill, which it is. It's a skill. It's like taking a penalty kick. It's like, it's like playing darts, a fine motor skill. If they can achieve that level of control before they go to surgery, it's much easier to refresh the skill afterwards. And, and Craig, so that, that, that kind of makes sense to me. And, and I think men like the analogy if, if they're going to have like a knee replacement or a hip replacement or some shoulder surgery, you know, do the work, do some of the work beforehand. Is that also the same with the erectile dysfunction? So the men that, that we see really struggle with the pump. They're not really sure what they should be doing with the pump. Should they maybe, should they be using the pump even a little bit maybe pre-surgery just to get used to how to use it because it's it's not the easiest thing to use particularly post-surgery the first few times okay good point i'm going to backtrack a little before that there are two things towards erectile dysfunction that the man should be doing pre-surgery so got his diagnosis surgery set anywhere four to six weeks down the track whatever it might be but i think they should start this at least four weeks in advance one have as many erections as they can that uh, they need to have a penis as healthy as possible. So it may be their life situation, other comorbidities, cardiovascular disease, have opportunity, lack of a partner, lack of a willing partner, have limited their opportunity to have active erections for a purpose, but that doesn't mean you can have one just to have an erection because blood flow, oxygenation, stretching the elastic tissues of the penis as often as possible within, you know, if you're still going to go to work, you can't do it as often as you'd like to, but you'd get it done several times a day would be good to 
just go into the surgery with your penis as in as healthy, elastic, responsive state as possible. All its biochemical pathways have been recently refreshed and, and the, the prostate is empty. You've got rid of all the stored sperm uh, if you take your erection to the full, the full result. Um, but there you go, that's, um, that's the first thing. Have some erectile practice. It can involve another person or it may not. That's your entirely their choice, but they'll sort that out. The second thing is take the opportunity to discover which of the erectile function medications, the PDN5 inhibitors, of which there, there are three, the, the, the um, Cialis, uh, the, the, uh, the one that's the Viagra and the uh, Latril, that you respond best to. They all have a similar goal in end, and that is to facilitate erectile function, but they work at different pathways of the biochemistry of the erectile process. And some men respond really well to Viagra, others don't get much of a result with that, others respond well to Cialis, but don't get a result. So if they can get a small test dose from their doctor and find out which of those they respond best to, and then stop testing themselves for at least a week before surgery, we know which medication they're most likely to respond to if they need it down the track. So it's a matter of just getting some more information about that man's physiology and, and where we can leverage it down the track for, for if, if he needs any assistance with erectile function. They are, not everyone does, but many, many do. And uh, knowing which drug is gonna work is a huge advantage. Yeah. Now that, that, that is a brilliant suggestion to me and say the, the men that you've come across or the men that your Australian colleagues come across, are they either general physicians, like say, there is, are there family doctors or there, are there urologists? Are they quite proactive, that approach to say, well, what works for you? Because I know here in the UK, even post-surgery, it's quite a struggle to get, to get those men, those um, medications prescribed. Indeed, especially when there's no clinical reason at that stage for them to need it. Oh, no, I mean post-surgery. Even post-surgery. Well, there you go. Um, that's less of a problem here. Um, but that said, I guess the, 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 uh, the man will have to insist, you know, the patient. And a working relationship between yourself and, and your colleagues in physiotherapy and the urological groups in their areas that is that is so important and there is no shortage of, of evidence of, of good quality evidence in the journals that these men should and women urologists should be reading that can can uh, reinforce that however these specialists and in australia and in my limited experience overseas they see these intrusions by us and request by patients as questioning their competence. Exactly. Questioning their competence. In other words, I'm not satisfied with what you've done, doc. I can't get an erection. I'm still incontinent. I want to try a pump. I want to try medication for the, this. And they're immediately thinking, oh, how dare you? Um, so their ego is probably the biggest obstacle. And my goal when working with urologists, I'm just about to start a new program with our local urology group here for uh, home visits for, for men after the procedure. So not having to come to a clinic, but I will, well, and others who I train will, will visit them. Um, and my, my line to the urologist is, you know, I'm only here for one purpose, to make you look good. Yeah, and that's, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. that's a good line. That's a good line. Yeah. Um, and my, obviously my real purpose is to help the man become yeah, exactly, and yeah. regain his record. But that's not what the surgeon wants to hear. He wants to hear, oh, you, you, she, uh, you're here to make me look good. I'm now I'm listening. Tell me how that will happen. Yeah, so, um, but that's, from a patient point of view, it's hard to prosecute your case um, a, to a specialist who's not listening. Yeah, so I guess that's one of the things. When you're, when you're shopping around, if you have the opportunity to get second and third opinions, you want to find somebody not only good at their job, but who can listen. Who's, and who's in, addition to side, lots, in addition to lots of uh, patients and patients' partners listening to our uh, Zoom interview, we will also have loads of our physiotherapy colleagues. And one of, the, one of the key questions that several people asked, and they'd like to hear your thoughts on it, is, you know, how do we 
as physiotherapists build a bigger profile in that urology community. And I know, I know, we haven't got the rest. We haven't got four hours to do this, but maybe what are what are, and I, and I think you've already answered it to a degree. Is, is maybe going with that message, not that we're gonna we we want to really help men with urinary incontinence after your surgery, but we want to make you look good. So what, what what can we do to try and you know just really get more awareness among the urology community? To, because we know we can help these men, and we know these men are struggling. Uh, true. The uh, a wiser person than me once said, um, "If you want to, if you want to know and, and influence what the cows are doing, you've got to get out in the herd." Um, the we need to go where they are because they are not going to come to us. So we need to somehow inveigle some opportunities, use our networks to appear in front of them at their clinical meetings with just a 10 minute talk on what physio does before and after or at their at, at meetings of the Prostate Cancer UK where they have their support groups and they will have urologists come in and talk. Well, find out from your local group when the local urologist is coming to talk and be there. Meet them out of their office, meet them in the field where the, it's a level playing field and engage with them there and, and have hopefully some of the support group saying, oh, this physio here, she does a great job. You know, she helped me so much um, because that's when they start to listen is when the patients give them feedback. The patients won't necessarily give them feedback unless you provide them with the tools to do so. So as a, as a practitioner, as a physio, I would say you're going back to see your urologist. This is what we're going to tell them, and we'll write it down if need be. Um, you are now um, your bladder volume uh, for each from your bladder diary. You are now retaining 250, whereas you know two weeks ago you struggled to retain 150 mils uh, before you had urgency, or you um, your postvoidal dribbling is is much less, or or your your ability to, you, you've, you've started to get what we would call a semi-erection spontaneously at night um, uh, with, with manual stimulation. Uh, so give them some, and that's part of our penile health rehabilitation program. So we would um, actually tell them, ask the patient to report specifically, because when they go in, the surgeon will say, how are you doing? And I'll say, oh, going okay, thanks, yeah. That's it, that's it. Uh, but no, not going okay, you are, have improved in these areas and thanks to the physio program you sent me to, Doc, I'm really making some, some progress here. Oh, well, now they're listening. Now, they're, now we're working as a team. So enable your patients to give specific feedback to the urology team uh, about what's improved and how their treatment has affected it, not just give a global, I'm okay or I'm not happy. Um, and, and try and get out where the urologists gather and, and talk to them in that area as much as you can. And of course, you've got to know your stuff because they do. And yeah, they will yeah, test yeah. you. They will test you. And if you don't know something, tell them you don't know. That's okay. They know something you don't know. That makes them feel good as well. Yeah. And I think the people that I find have been really receptive are the urology nurse specialists. Because the urology nurse specialists are the, are the uh, professionals who are dealing with these men who are really struggling and are dealing with their partners. And one really interesting thing that a I went to met a couple of different urology specialists several years ago, and they said to me, and they were working in a massive hospital nearby, and they said, you're the first, they said two things, you're the first physio who's ever come to speak to us. Yeah. And the second thing they said was, that you know, we tried to attend some of the physiotherapy courses, and they've said no, there weren't very, very many. And the people organizing those courses have said to us, You're not a physio, you can't attend. It shows that we as a profession are not really into the age of professional working. And I know people don't like to hear that, but it's true. It sounds terribly insecure. Um, the we have much to share and much to learn from, as you say, these, these nurses working at the interface, whether they're continence nurses or whether they're prostate care nurses. I, I welcome them to, to any of my physio training sessions. I put them on the list. Uh, yes, if you know, if a physio registers, if you know, if you work with a prostate cancer nurse or, or, or continence nurse, let them know this is on because they are welcome. Uh, they will learn things that are useful. They will also um, learn what you do. 
which will be useful. Uh, so what your scope of practice is and what you're good at. So we all we all benefit from that. I've done quite a few national tours in Australia with uh, where continence nurses and prostate care nurses are the entire audience um, talking about physiotherapy and they can't get enough of it. They really want to know what yeah. we've got to offer. Function at an open door. Yes, yeah. Not to do it, but to know what's available for their clients, yes. And so you, we kind of touched upon that, you know, two of the big problems post uh, radical prostatectomy are urinary incontinence yes. and erectile dysfunction. So they're, they're, they tend to probably be the two big things that the men will benefit from coming to see a, a men's health physiotherapist. What are some of the other problems that you see that these men have, Craig? Recurrence, metastases. Um, the survival rate for five years is, is improved out of sight, and even for 10 years is improving, but there, it's still an inexact science. The removal of the prostate gland or radiation oncology is never any guarantee. All the tumor cells have been eradicated from the body and the likelihood of, of long-term metastases comes up. And we can offer education on how to sabotage that metastasizing process through improved quality of life, nutrition, physical activity, stress management, immunize, uh, you know, fortifying your immune system with improved uh, food decisions, cutting back alcohol, um, coffee is okay. Good news, coffee is okay. That's but, and it is, it is 11 in the morning here. Oh yeah, fair enough, all right. Um, and, and a little bit of alcohol is, is perfectly fine too, Excellent. but I'm liking excesses, that excesses of these things are, are obviously, so it's a matter of, and while when a man's had a decent cancer scare, He's listening for a while. He's paying attention. Um, once the cancer is eradicated and his first and second PSA tests come back post-treatment as, uh, as uh, 0.01, so undetectable, um, you are safe. We got it all. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming, says the specialist. Um, but there's never any guarantee that they got it all. It's just at the moment, there's no evidence they, that they did not get it all. So um, it's probably a bit of a, an over-congratulations on behalf of the, uh, the specialist. But that's what the man wants to hear and he will feel better for that but he's been fixed why should i reduce my alcohol content why should i do more physical activity why should i suddenly start looking after myself because i've been fixed and we missed that opportunity to get the behavioral change that will protect them from the likelihood of a metastasis and secondly diabetes cardiovascular disease um, other comorbidities that will take them out eventually so all of which those simple strategies can make a difference. And that's the subject of the, that second book, the Prostate Playbook. It's about sabotaging prostate cancer before you get it, after you've got it, and after it's been treated to, uh, to suppress the growth and, and progression of the disease. And you talked, you talked at the start about that you have, uh, that you're uh, heavily involved in, the, in, in setting up the exercise programs in the men's shed. Yeah. And, you know, we both know our dear friend, Jo Milius, really well. And jo has set up her exercise foundation, PROST, which, for, which is for men who've been through prostate cancer. So we know that exercise is important for these men. But these men initially can struggle with getting back to exercise because some of them may not have exercised anyways. And yes. then some of them may have exercised, but are concerned that well is it going to affect my bladder am i going to leak so what are some useful ways of trying in the early stages post-surgery of trying to get men back into exercise i try and introduce the idea of total body exercise at the same time i introduce pelvic floor exercises if we just focus on the pelvic floor work, which is for their continence retraining and is critically important, but it's, it's part of the whole. So I would have them starting to do some more challenging total bodies like walking program. And they can do their pelvic floor exercises while they're walking. They can set a distance between two driveways or between two lampposts that they're going to aspire to be able to sustain a pelvic floor contraction while walking and breathing for that distance. And they can't do it at the start, but over a period of weeks and months, they gain the stamina in their pelvic floor muscles to be able to achieve that goal. Then we extend the goal. Um, but it's the walking that's doing as much good because uh, particularly for their, their erectile dysfunction uh, is, is reliant on good cardiovascular blood flow. 
and getting them out doing some movement, moving around, doing yard work or, or gardening or, or uh, walking programs, kayaking, cycling, even if they're cycling in their garden shed on an ergometer, it doesn't matter, but doing something to keep their blood flow stimulated and improve their, their biochemical pathways for all those uh, arterial responses, one of which is erectile function, um, is important. So I don't, I don't isolate the pelvic floor and say, this is all we're going to do. It's, we're doing pelvic floor for this reason. We're also going to start you on a walking program for this reason. Uh, long-term erectile function, but also to reduce your girth, to reduce your, your uh, belly fat, to reduce your cholesterol levels, your, your lipid levels, to improve your lung function, to uh, basically give you a better quality of life. You've beaten cancer. We'll tell them that. We'll give them that. You've beaten cancer. What are you going to do with the rest of your life? Be sick again? Wait for the next thing to get you? I, That's I a very good blunt. point, actually. That's a very good point. Yeah. I can be quite blunt with them, I must admit, if, if they're just lolling around wallowing in cancer. And, and even worse, when they're frequenting a support group that's full of other wallowers, wallowing around talking about, oh, we've had prostate cancer, it's been terrible. And, uh, you know, how, how many pads are you using? Oh, I'm using more pads than you're using. I'm in more trouble than you are. And it, you can run the risk of, of, of reinforcing your. Your, your lack of success by associating with others with an equal lack of success and thinking, well, I'm not too bad then, uh, as opposed to, uh, and, and one of the questions you, you forewarned me was, uh, should men go to a, a support group? Well, say so yes, if it is a proper support group, as opposed to one that just wallows around talking about the problems. And I must admit, I, I'm very fortunate to have been to several in the West Midlands, and I've got to know the coordinators of one really well, and and I, I and they were I thought inspirational places, upbeat, uh, do a lot of work. So it's uh, but yeah, you need to find a, a good a good group. A good group. It will depend on the leadership of the group. Yeah. That's the one that sets the tone. And uh, and I've I've been to some excellent ones, and I've been to some where I thought you could do with a change of leadership here because you you need you're stuck in a, a rut, but. No, it's not my job to do that. Um, men go and try it. I, I, I suggest that they visit a couple of support groups and see where's the best fit. And if it's a support group that can blend some physical activity into the education and the social support and the conversation stuff, like Jo does with her cross group, even better, even better. Uh, and, and there's a very successful, I'm not sure if it's still going, but was successful initially in the English Premier League uh, where they opened up the the club gyms for men's health sessions um, in various of, of the EPL teams. And that was yeah, like inspirational. Here, you, I think here, here in the UK, uh, prostate cancer has, has a, a huge profile because, you know, our, our main sport is football. Yes. And it, our main sports channel is Sky Sports. But all of the presenters, they all have the prostate cancer pin. Ah, good. They, all of them. And one of the really big presenters, uh, Jeff Sterling, has done huge amounts of fundraising for prostate cancer. And then they've got all the football teams into the uh, charitable end of that, the Men United. So you see it Good. everywhere. A, yes. a, couple of, a couple of other questions then. Sure. From, from uh, some, some patients. So uh, in our guidelines, in our clinical guidelines, it's recommended that men will use the pump as part of that strategy to improve uh, erectile function. Now I've used the pump myself and the pump takes a while to get used to, but it's I think it's, sorry. It's a bizarre feeling. Yes. It's a bizarre <laughs> feeling. And that's, and, and whereas post post radical prostatectomy, men have, they have some loss in penile length. So what That's another are some, thing I weren't told about. Yeah, exactly. So what are some top tips for using that you find, maybe two or three top tips for getting kind of comfortable and competent with the pump? Because initially, the pump can look very big. Yeah. Um, I've taken board what you said earlier about should we expose them to the pump before surgery? I've never done that. It's got me thinking. but. 
because you're not sure which of the men are going to need it afterwards, but they've made the financial out that you don't really want a secondhand pump. Um, so you're going to buy one and you may not use it again. We Understand. get it on prescription. Very good. So that's fully funded by the government. Well, what a go ahead place you, you've got. That's good. But, but still, here. the patients will come in and, and some of them will. will some of them will know lots about the pump, some will know nothing about them, which, which is all about this education, I suppose. Sorry, keep going, Craig. Oh, Tips about the pump. the pump. The first thing, when I start talking about the pump to the gents and their partners, because I prefer them both to be there at the, at the time, is um, it's not about sex. It's not about penetrative sex. It's not about finding out if you have it all. It's only about we want to rehab your penis. We want to have as healthy a penis as possible because we're pretty sure that the erectile function loss is to do with damage or, or you know, mild or severe of the nerve supply that activates the erectile process, putting aside their poor cardiovascular supply. We'll come back to that one. But um, the nerve damage associated with removal of the prostate um, just disables the wiring to initiate, to get the starter motor turning over uh, for, for an erectile function. And, and that will heal nerves heal ever so slowly and if it, the nerve is stretched or bruised during surgery it could take six to 12 weeks to recover if it's been severed it may never recover if some if the, if the two ends are nowhere near each other or it might be severed but close enough that there can be some networking of the nerve fibers but that will take years that can take years so um, what we want is when the wiring is connected that the plumbing is still healthy and the wiring becomes connected again, the plumbing is still healthy. So we're using the pump, which is a plumbing device, uh, to draw fluid um, into the penis, to keep it elastic, to keep it, uh, to keep the, the chambers that need to be stretched for an erection, to keep them accustomed to being filled and to sustain that for a short period of time. So we shift the why. Yes, we shift so the why. It's not about sex. Yes. The primary reason is for a healthy penis. Now, a healthy penis at some stage may be very useful to have sex again, uh, but that's not why we're starting with the pump. That might be the end game, but it's not what I'm trying to sell it on because too many will be disappointed with the initial results and they will give up. Yes. They will give and, up. Yeah. and then Joe talks a lot about the importance of pad weaning, of getting, of reducing down the number of pads. Now, Lots of men will be will be doing really well with their continence, but they'll still be reluctant to drop down either the size of the pad or the or uh, suppose a classic one is someone's been dry at night for six weeks, but they're still wearing a big pad in bed just in case. Or they're so what are what are some top tips you have on how to do this kind of pad weaning or reduce down the number of pads, it's, particularly to the man who's doing well. It's a, it's a fear thing. And, and I think Joe's thing is if they have two dry nights in a row, get rid of the pads. Yeah, Joe was very militant. Oh, yeah, yes. And, and, and she says, if you can do that, you're an absolute hero. And I agree because it goes against everything their brain is telling them that I'm going to wet the bed. And that's a very uncomfortable process. So I will just make a very simple uh, suggestion to them. When you first go mm, pad free at night, put in uh, a, a continent sheet underneath your on, on your bed. So if you do have a leak, you don't have to change both sides of the linen on, on the bed. You don't have to get out and spend the next half an hour remaking your whole bed. You just need to take away the bluey that's, uh, that's got a bit damp and put another one in and keep going to sleep and relax because you're not going to do too much damage. So a sheet that's plastic on one side and absorbent on the other that you know, they use in the hospitals and various other places. The continence nurses could obviously supply those if they're under that sort of care but you can buy them at any any drugstore at boots they'd have them or any of the others that uh, that they could just give them that degree of safety of backup and they wake up in the morning and that that sheet's dry and that's dry again and they've used the same sheet for six months well they should have got rid of it five and a half months ago um because they don't need it anymore they're sick they're nocturnal continent which is brilliant it means that the autonomic nervous system that seals the bladder overnight is competent. So the internal urethral sphincter is doing the job without them even being awake and having to think about it. Um, so just, just go pad free after two nights, but if you need a backup, put in a little continent sheet underneath your hips there, just in case. But if that's dry after two more nights, get rid of everything, be brave. 
Yeah. In case people listening to this are wondering when, when are these guys going to stop, because we're getting in 45 minutes. Just a couple more questions. So, yeah, sure. we, we talked a little bit about how to increase our profile within the urology community, mm. which was brilliant. So, how do we, as, uh, as physiotherapists with an interest in men's health, how do we kind of increase our profile within the physiotherapy community? Because there's lots of physios might see these men for a hip replacement or back pain, or they might be seeing their, they might be seeing the son of someone who's had prostate cancer. So how do we in increase our prof? Like lots of people know to a degree what a women's health physio does, although not, yeah. not in a huge amount of detail, but, but men's health, you know, I meet lots of physios and I say I'm, I work in men's health and they go, you know, what is that? What is that? So how do we, how can we lift our profile? Because you guys in Australia are much better at this. Um, that's an excellent question. I, I, we certainly haven't nailed it yet, but we're, we're working on it. Uh, and I must say that because women's health in the continent's pelvic health area has been so strong and, and such a strong scope of practice within physiotherapy, it has been difficult even within the profession for those seasoned practitioners to acknowledge that there is a need because they've never had to confront that. Um, and indeed an expertise that they may not have that could be part of continent's health as an overall unit. So, and Joe has fought this battle, Joe Milios in, in Perth has fought this battle as, as hard and as tough as anybody. And, and finally, when she proved through her PhD studies that what we do makes a difference they had to start listening and acknowledging and not only her, but the levels above where the barriers were started to break down. And uh, she has been, uh, as and rightly so, quite, quite valued in her contribution. Uh, me as a simple clinician working in the background, even though I started some you know, 15 years before Joe got into it, um, uh, I'm happy that she's finally proved that things we do work. Uh, it's been fabulous. So we now have an evidence base. And that is very strong in our profession. We also have an army of men out there who've had benefits uh, from what we do, who uh, are hopefully talking about us and, and our contribution as we go out. So there'll be a tipping point as there is with any movement. And it just is going to, it, it's always tough being at the beginning of these, these growths in professional development because it, it just takes a while for it to, to filter through. I think we're doing quite well. I think we've come a long way in, in a fairly short distance. Um, certainly in Australia, when we started, uh, we realized that Joe, myself, Peter Dornan and, and Stuart Baptist got together probably about eight years ago now, uh, six or eight years. And we realized nobody was training men's pelvic health inside the profession. So we said, well, why don't we just do it on our own and see what happens? So we started putting courses together and running them outside of the profession. Uh, and uh, we're overwhelmed with participation and interest. And now it's starting to be, now the profession's taking ownership of that again and trying to bring the, the education process back under their influence, um, which is fine, as long as it's still good quality and evidence-based, and which it is, so I'm happy with it. And I'm even working with the APA now. Uh, yeah, and it's good. I think, I'm, I think, now I may be wrong, and I'm sure if I'm wrong, someone will correct me very quickly. Uh, I think that the it was either the Australian or the New Zealand Association was the first to change their special interest group title to include men's health, because instead of having women's health, I'm sure it was Australia and New Zealand was the first to change to incorporate the term of men's health, which is always a, a good step forward. It was, it was an acknowledgement. And, and I can still recall the, the, the meeting at the national conference where, uh, where I, I stood up and, and advocated that that was necessary, but also advocated that men's health is not just about their dicks. Men's health is not penocentric. Uh, men's health is the whole man and the whole organism has to be looked after as well and you cannot just separate out the pelvic health from the rest of the the rest of the bloke so um that has been less than overwhelmingly accepted but it's still the point i make is i'm not there to just for the guy to have a functional penis i need to go and have a functional life to have energy to have, be able to sleep well to to be able to eat well and enjoy his mates and his time out and his partner and his family and and for as long as possible 
and at the same time to feel like he's in control of his bladder and has as much erectile function as requires for the current lifestyle he's leading and any other health things that come up along the way. So I'm, I'm looking like a contract for, for life. We, we become a, a, a health coach for men because they certainly and, need it. And it's clear from listening to you, Craig, and anyone who listens to this or, or kind of watches it, th that you are passionate about this. Yes. So, and, uh, so the, the people that inspire me are yourself. I think you know that. Uh, uh, Peter, Peter Dornan. Uh, Joe in particular and, and Stuart, you know, the four of you have really inspired me. So who inspires you to kind of keep going? Oh, um, I think it's the it's the, the 68 or 7 year old bloke who sits down in your clinic in front of you and says, thank you. I never thought this could happen. You know, I've been pad free for three months. I've got enough erectile function to keep both of us happy at home. Um, or I haven't got erectile function, but I'm okay with that. And I'm pretty comfortable with, with how things are going. It's the, I've, I've worked for most of my career, it was with elite athletes and you know up to Olympic level and national sporting team level. And yes, that was rewarding, but nowhere near as professionally rewarding. I would agree with you. Yeah, I would agree with you. As these, not simple men, but men with huge life experience, but did not have the tools to fix themselves after their prostate surgery. And I was able to help them navigate that and give them some, some insights and some practice and some instructions. And they went away, they still do the work. I don't fix them, they have to do the work. And then they come back and they say, thank you. Thanks for that signpost. That was just what I needed when I needed it. Yeah. And that, that's what gets me excited, yeah. Last year, uh, kind of one, so it was, benefit of, of COVID in a way was that it, it, it made us all more comfortable with doing these kind of zo using Zoom. So last year I was really honoured and uh, of all the people I met, it was one person I was really in awe. So I, I met Professor Judah Thompson yes. from uh, Curtin University uh, and we all know of Judith's work here in the UK and Judith spoke really passionately about you know, trying to train up physiotherapists to do transabdominal ultrasound. So this is where you put an ultrasound probe, someone's lower tummy, and you can see, is their pelvic floor contracting and relaxing? And Judith felt, which I agree, was that this kind of is a good way to softly bring people in so they can look at pelvic floor function externally. And that, that also fits well with, with Joe's work trying to see can those men do a, a pelvic floor contraction do, do you see that that's got a big role to play um if obviously if you don't need a machine and they are very costly but if you have a machine to use i'm, I'm, I'm going to confess now jared i've, I've never owned a real-time ultrasound machine and most a lot of people yeah. haven't because they are expensive they're expensive and and i think you need to have access to one with somebody who does them frequently enough to be good at it. But not every physio who wants to do men's health needs to have that equipment, but they need to have access to somebody nearby who has, who, and a good working arrangement so we can get rid of this ridiculous fear, oh no, they're gonna steal my patient. Uh, so we get rid of that nonsense and work collaboratively. I mean, it's like sending them off for, for you know, avoiding test, or it's like sending them off for a, for a um, you know, diabetes test, yeah, the, the diagnostics, because the ultrasound is a teaching tool. It's not a home training tool. Yeah, no, I like yes, that. I like that, actually. It can get them, over the hump, get them over the hump of a learning barrier that you cannot get past just with manual instruction and, and feedback, where you need to actually show them something visually, because some people are just visual learners. They won't get it from tactile training and auditory feedback. Yeah, so they can they see, it. see something. They, these visual learners, they boom on that. Um, and if it's done well, say, so look, this is now how you do it correctly. I'm going to send you back to your physio to look after the dose progressions and the other aspects of your healthcare. Um, so your a bit physio. of collaborative working. Definitely, definitely, yes. So Which physios I'm, I'm also aren't brilliant at. No, no, I, I don't. Don't start me. That's another hour session. What on, do you think? But you've, physio. you've, as as you've said in your own words, you know, you've worked as a physiotherapist for a good stretch. And you've done yes. very different things. What do you see as what's the next big area in men's health? Well, the next big area in men's health. The next big area in men's health. Well, if we saw, or where do you see it going? Yeah. Well, I think 
I think it's going to go into, into that um, the health coaching phase of preventative. It's, it's you know the the idea of of we know what kills men: cardiovascular disease, complications from diabetes, prostate cancer, bowel cancer, lung cancer, um, motor vehicle accidents. That's a tricky one, um, but we know what the risks for men are. The problem is the programming in our Western societies for how men embrace masculinity embraces the risks of all those things, that they actively adopt lifestyles that compromise their health. They make bad decisions for, in, a, in a nutshell. They make bad decisions because making bad decisions makes them look more masculine. Interesting. And drives women berserk, drives mothers and wives and sisters crazy but that is how we program young men and i am seeing um younger men my sons and hopefully then their sons have a different approach to their health care they're not fully there yet but they're a bit more open to it than our my generation was of of how their masculinity is modeled on preceding generations and how it's accepted by others for their career development for their sporting expertise for their relationships you know, there's a shitstorm going on with with in Australia at the moment with um, violence and and, and uh, prejudice against women in all sorts of arenas. We've seen it in the states. I'm sure it's happened in yes. the UK as well. And um, the women have had enough of this. But this concept of toxic masculinity, the first victim is the man. He loses so many opportunities to have a fulfilling and long life and a healthy life as soon as he goes down the toxic masculinity pathway. And so the next thing in men's health is to somehow, and I'm no guru on how to make this happen, but somehow this generational shift so that men embrace healthful behaviours as a positive aspect of masculinity. And I'm not talking muscles. Look at yeah, body yeah, body. yeah. Yeah, or sporting and out, kind of outside of work, we I think here in the UK we all think people in Australia just have the most amazing life ever because you get good weather, which we don't. We don't get the weather, so we're a bit obsessed with that. So, what do you do? What do you do outside of work to relax? Okay, um, to relax, I play saxophone in a local concert band. Ah. I am a beekeeper, uh, so I harvest honey from our bees. I to physical work on our property, which is five acres. So it's a substantial looking after the rainforest. And I do three mornings a week of weight training and three mornings a week of cycling, road cycling. So that's my fitness regime. Uh, my, well, I'm not, a, not fitness, I'm not, because I'm not training to be fit for something. It's my health regime. It's, it's staying alive stuff, okay? You know, I've had my health issues over the years. As, as we don't need to go into them now. And I know that if I don't look after this machine, it's going to fail. And when I get up in the morning, I don't always want to go lift weights. I don't always want to get on the bike when it's a bit drizzly or, you know, we've, there's a cloud in the sky. That's, that's you know, bad weather down here. Um, so the... But I know on those days when I go, the benefits are multifold, you know, yeah. multiplied yeah. by the fact that I overcame my inertia. And that's it, overcoming inertia to actually go, because when you come back, you always feel a lot yeah. better for it. That's a good example, overcoming yeah. inertia. Yeah. And last yeah. question, this will be the most, this will be the easiest question you've ever had oh, to right. answer. That thing behind you, is that a trophy or a lamp, the, the thing behind you to the right? Okay, this is... Um... Actually, it's bigger than it looks and heavier. This Olympic is the Olympic torch from Sydney. Wow. Let me find it. Yes. Wow. Sydney Olympic torch. Uh, I was in the torch bearing relay uh, up here on the Sunshine Coast, and they let you keep the torch you run with. So... I was going to say, do they know you took it? <laughs> well, they do disable the flame. Wow. They, 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 before you're allowed to take it away, they disable it so you can't relight it. Sadly, because then I could run around the neighbourhood and pretend I could be a real right knob, I'd tell you. But uh, um, no. Every but, yes, neighbourhood has my, to have one. One of my Olympic souvenirs is, is a genuine, authentic Sydney Olympic torch. Yes. Mm. I'm glad thanks I Thanks for have noticing. Yeah. Craig, many, many thanks. Many, many thanks. And as I said at the start, you know, many men have um, got a huge amount out of reading your book. I think particularly in my example, the, the, the first one, the... Um, uh, the Men's Health Action Plan. So a big thanks for all the work you do. 
And so how do where do people find you online? How do people find you oh, online? Very easy. Just go to craigallingham.com. Craigallingham.com. That's my website, and that will lead you to various other websites specifically for the map or the playbook. Uh, and thank you. You've also taken delivery of a, a small quantity of those books to distribute in the UK and Ireland, which I appreciate. Thank you very much. Happy I don't to have, have an official distributor there, so that, that will get us started. Um, even though Stephen Fry's endorsed the book, um, I haven't had a lot of traffic coming from Prostate Cancer UK yet to say we'd like to take that on board, but uh, I live in hope. Um, we can try. We can keep trying. Keep trying. Yeah, we're, we're starting to get some interest in the book in the States, which is good, uh, through Adam Gilvey and, uh, and one of the distributors over there, so they're starting to place some orders. Um, but yeah, I can certainly, uh, they can order online or they can, and yeah, then the, book is, the, book the is UK amazing. order, I'll send it to you. Yes. Yeah, so. The book is amazing. So Craig, many thanks. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon in Queensland. And uh, oh, it's been yeah. a real pleasure to speak to you. And just to say again, and, and thank you to, to all of the people, both patients and physiotherapists who submitted questions to us. We really appreciate people taking the time to do that. Yes, thank you. And, and I look forward, I look forward to coming back. Yeah, yeah, so that's, yeah and hopefully we can get you over. But well, maybe we could do something like this because this works well. So, Craig, really big thanks and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.